from Miletus, I sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. I have to draw on some strength that I usually draw on at funerals. Sometimes you get before an audience to do a funeral of someone you've known, and you have to muster the strength to get through, and I'm going to have to muster the strength to get through today. I say good morning, but I also say goodbye today. Now, to be clear, I will be here tonight, and I will be here Wednesday, but this will be my last sermon as your evangelist here at Fishers. It's been my honor to serve in that capacity. I look forward to a new work, but I also am grieved to say goodbye to all of you. I chose as my closing text this passage in Acts the 20th chapter. We're going to look at, actually on down to the end of verse 38, we're going to be looking at that whole text and all of the points will come from that text. But this was Paul's farewell speech to the elders at Ephesus. He had preached there only three years. Now that seems like insignificant compared to 16 years that I've been here. But he preached there for three years. And it indicates in verse 25 that he does not expect to see these individuals again. He said there, Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. By the way, did you catch that little you all there? You all. Y'all, as they say down south. But these are things we don't know. We don't know if we'll see one another again. We hope that we do. Uh, but one thing's for sure, we will see one another in heaven. But Paul, as he is having this talk, he, he indicates he's not sure that he'll ever see these individuals again. So his, uh, his parting words were especially touching to these folks. Uh, he reminds them in this text of his past work with them, and we're going to do a, bit, a little bit of that this morning. And he leaves some parting advice to them, and we're going to do some of that as well. So this text is a nice farewell address, and I'm going to use the words of God to kind of organize my thoughts here. Uh, this will be a very emotional sermon for me. You know how I am. You know how I get. So I'm going to try and hang it together, do the best I can. Uh, pray for me, if you will. I know I already had one brother tell me he's going to do that. But uh, let's just think about the title of the lesson here, What I Leave Behind. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. And the first thing I'd like to suggest to you is this. I'm leaving behind a church of Christ. Look with me here at verse 17. It says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church. In those days there was but one church, uh, one body of people that belonged to Christ. Today we don't see that, but in those days there was only one church. So this was a church of Christ. Notice how I put that in parentheses. This was a group of people. That's really what the word church means, a group of people or an assembly or a congregation. And so it's a group of people belonging to Christ. If you go back with me here to the 18th chapter just a moment, chapter 18, verses 18 through 21, we learn that Paul and Priscilla and Aquila actually started the church at Ephesus. Uh, it says in 18:18 uh, 18, 18, that Paul remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had his hair cut off in Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus. Now that's what we're having here, this speech at Ephesus. He came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. This is the beginnings of the church there at Ephesus. And Paul and Aquila and Priscilla had a hand in starting that church. And Paul said, I got to go. I can't stay. I'm going to leave Priscilla and Aquila here, but I got to move on to Jerusalem, but I'll come back. And he did. He came back and he labored with that church for three years. And you see that going back to our text in Acts 20, and you might just keep that marked. I should have said that at the beginning. But in Acts 20 and verse 31, Paul reminds them, he says, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night 
and day with tears. So he came back to Ephesus just as he said he would, and he worked with them for three years. And now as we think about how that applies here, I didn't start this congregation. Uh, it was already in existence, had been for some time by the time I got here. Originally you all met in another location, but at some point you decided to build this facility here on this property. And I, as I recall, I timed it just right. I waited till all the hammering and nailing was done, and then I showed up. So, <laughs> so I showed up right at the very beginning of your usage of this building. And I've been here for 16 years, and I've enjoyed every year of it. Now, there have been ups and downs, and there have been highs and lows, and there have been good times, and there have been bad times, and there have been disagreements about this, that, and the other. But I'll tell you what, I've enjoyed every day of it. I don't regret it. And when I leave this place, I want you to know that I'm leaving the same thing I found. When I came here, I found a church of Christ. I did not find something other than that. I found a church of Christ, a group of disciples dedicated to Jesus, and that's what I leave behind. I haven't changed you at all in that sense. Now, there have been a lot of changes, if you stop and think about it. We've added members and we've lost members. The, 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 the composition of the crowd looks radically different than it did back then. Back then there were only about 70 souls meeting and uh, some of them have left and moved on and some of them have passed away and some have moved in and some have been baptized. So we've added members and we've lost members. In that sense there's been change. Uh, and you think about the facilities. We've added on to the facilities I don't know how many times. We expanded the auditorium. We expanded classrooms. We put that little glass foyer out there. We've expanded the parking lot. So many ways and so many things that we've changed. But the church itself, the people, are still a church of Christ. They're still a body of people dedicated to serving Jesus Christ. And so I leave just exactly what I found here. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Uh, and we need to be grateful for that. And we need to continue to strive to be a church of Christ. I've always believed that the distinguishing characteristic of the church of Christ, and let me just rephrase that, the distinguishing characteristic of the church of Christ is loyalty to Christ. That's it in a nutshell. Once we lose that, we cease to be a church of Christ. So we must always look to Him as our head, we must always look to Him as our guide, and we must always follow Him. As long as we do that, we'll be a church of Christ. When we cease doing that, then we cease being a church of Christ. The sign may still say church of Christ, but we cease listening to Jesus and we cease being a church. So I leave behind exactly what I found here. Secondly, I want you to know that I leave behind a church instructed. You know, I've noticed over the years, and no matter, and this is true in any congregation, but you have everybody at different levels of knowledge. Not everybody is at the same level. That's always going to be true. That's a thing that's always in flux. Just as surely as members come and go, uh, the knowledge level also is in flux, along with those members as they come and as they go. And so that's always true. But I want you to know that you've been taught over the last 16 years, not just by me, but primarily by me for sure. And Paul, here at the church at Ephesus, in those verses, in verses 18 to 27, I'm not going to read all of them, but just select portions here. For example, in verse 20 and 21, Paul says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and I taught you publicly and from house to house. And so Paul taught publicly and Paul taught privately, and so did Lanny Smith. Lanny Smith taught you publicly, and Lanny Smith taught you privately, and I did this for 16 long years, you see. And then we drop down here to verses 26 and 27 and notice what Paul says. He says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why is that, Paul? For, verse 27, because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. That's what I've tried to do. I've tried not to be a one-trick pony and just talk about one thing. I've tried to talk about a lot of things. We've talked about authority. We've talked about redemption. We've talked about Jesus. We've talked about the church. We've talked about worship. We've talked about a lot of things. And so we try to cover the whole counsel of God. So Paul said, I taught you thoroughly. And that's what I feel like I've done here. I feel like I've taught you thoroughly. Now, whether you receive that teaching or whether it's stuck or not is a different matter. But I've given you that information. And then in verse 31, we see that Paul taught constantly. He said, therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Look at the word warning there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but, but we need to understand that warnings are a part of preaching. You're warning people, and that's part of instruction. You're warning, beware of this and beware of that. There's this error and there's that error and this problem and that problem and these moral issues. And so you, you never stop. That never stops. 
And I feel as though I've done exactly what the Apostle Paul did. I taught you publicly, and I've taught you privately. I've taught you thoroughly, the whole counsel of God, and I've taught you constantly. I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, this is important. This is important regardless of who stands in this pulpit. A taught church is a strong church. If you want to have a strong congregation, and I believe this is a strong congregation, if you want to have a strong congregation, you can't be uh, wrapping up all your time and playing. Churches aren't play places. Churches aren't houses of play. Churches are houses of instruction. And so teaching is vital. And if you want a strong church, you have to have a taught church. In verse 32, uh, he says, Now, brethren, look at this, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. Notice that it's the Word that's going to do this. It's the Word that's going to build you up, and that means to edify you, that means to strengthen you, and it's going to give you an inheritance. You want to go to heaven, you've got to stay in the Word. And, and so a taught church is a strong church. And in fact, the Bible says that our faith is rooted in teaching, isn't it? Isn't that what Paul said to the Romans? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Any church that does not exalt the Word of God certainly is not a church of Christ. It must exalt the Word. It must point people to the Word. It must insist that people follow the Word. And it must warn people about departures from the Word. And that's what I've tried to do. That's what Paul did at Ephesus. And that's what I've tried to do here. And I want you to think for just a few moments about the different ways that I've done this. First of all, I've taught you in various classes. We have Sunday night classes, we, as I've said many times, we do things a little bit differently here in most churches, and this is the way it'll be when I go to Tennessee, they have their Bible studies on Sunday morning, we have ours on Sunday night, and then we have them on Wednesday night, and I've taught you in Bible classes, and we've covered all sorts of subjects, if you go back and think about the different things we've talked about. I've taught you from the pulpit right here, with many, many sermons. Uh, it's hard to tell how many, if you, I guess you could calculate it up, how many sermons I've preached from this very pulpit. I've taught you in the bulletin. The bulletin has evolved, in fact, over the years. If you'll recall, when I first came here, the bulletin was much larger. It was probably, uh, probably bigger than that. It was a bigger piece of paper with a lot more writing in it. And over time, it's evolved, and it's become a little more brief and a little bit more concise. But always there have been articles in there that are dealing with biblical subjects and trying to provide some instruction. And by the way, I love to write. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I feel like I can communicate much better in writing than I can verbally. And so I love the writing aspect of it, and I love writing those articles, and I hope you enjoyed reading them, uh, and I hope that you got something from it. I hope you gained from it. And then Brother Jared came up with this idea a few years back. He called it a snapshot. And you think about the expression, you know, you take a photograph, and, and it's a snapshot of a moment in time. And so a snapshot in terms of what we do here is just a snapshot of a sermon. Uh, it's, it's a, here, here's a sermon, poof, it's like that, and it's not a long 20 or 25 page track like they used to use in years past, but it's just a, a two or three page thing, and it contains sermon outlines, that's what they are, those are sermon outlines, and those are good for your own personal study, and they're good for you to pass along to others, and that's been a very popular thing, by the way, that was a great idea that Brother Jared had. And he did all the artwork. When you look at those, you see how nice they are. You can credit Jared for that. Uh, the material I put in there, but the, the nice artwork and the nice printing job, you can, you can contribute that to Jared. But those have been very popular and been a very effective way of teaching the truth. Those fly off the shelves and those go. And I've taught you in those ways. I've taught you and we're doing it right now via live stream. People are watching this. It's not just this audience that's here this morning. There are people out there uh, in the community who are watching online, watching exactly what we're doing right now. And so I've taught you by live stream. I've taught you by social media, and that's amazing to me because I don't do social media. <laughs> I, I don't have a Facebook account of my own, and I don't do anything on YouTube, but the church does. And so my sermon outlines are posted on Facebook. Sometimes my articles are posted on Facebook on the Fisher's website. And we have a YouTube channel where when the sermons are over, uh, the sermon part is trimmed down and put into a permanent format out there. And there are a lot of people who look at those. You go back and it, it's interesting to me if you ever go to our YouTube page, uh, click on, you can rearrange those sermons and click on most popular and it'll surprise you what pops up first. It's interesting. I find that fascinating. The most popular uh, it, and it'll rearrange it so you can see the most popular ones first. And, and so it's interesting. But I've taught you by means of social media. I've taught in gospel meetings around the area. I've also taught outside the state, but around the area. And the interesting thing is you are all gluttons for punishment. Some of you actually go to my meetings. 
when I'm here in the area. And you come and hear me again, even though you know you might hear a rerun. You might hear something I've already preached here, because usually when I go to a meeting, I want to use something that's tried and true, that's proven. I don't want to go in there with something new. I want to use something that's proven. So I go to a meeting, and you, some of you come to those. And you don't know how much I appreciate that and what an encouragement that is. But this is just showing you the different ways in which I've instructed you over the years. I've been into some of your homes and taught you the Bible right there in your homes. We've had classes. We've had special classes like the men's class. And we've done additional teaching that way. I've taught you in private conversations. Sometimes you'll just call me up or you'll email me. Uh, and we'll just have a private conversation. And we've had a lot of teaching done that way. And hopefully... I've taught you by example. Hopefully I've lived what I've preached. Hopefully I've practiced what I've preached. I'll leave that to you to decide uh, whether or not that's true, but I, hopefully I have. And so these are just the way. And so when I leave, I'm leaving behind a church that is instructed. You can't say, I didn't know this or I didn't know that because you've been taught. And you've been taught the whole counsel of God, and I have not ceased to do this day and night. With every opportunity that I've given, I do this. Well, there's another thing that's very important. I leave behind a church that is shepherded. That is, I'm talking about the elders. And if you hold your spot here, well, in fact, let's just look at verse 28 first, and then hold your place here, we'll look at another passage. But in Acts 20 and verse 28, and remember, this is actually who Paul's talking to in these verses. He's talking to the elders at Ephesus. You can see that back in verse 17. Uh, he called for the elders of the church, and they came. So this whole thing is a speech to the elders. And in verse 29, he reminds those elders of what their obligations are. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves. Number one, get your own house in order. Number two, take heed to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd, there's our word, to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Now, I have taken this as a personal thing with me. Whenever I go, to, and I've, it's interesting, there's another interesting thing. I've only been to two full-time works in my life, 16 years here, 16 years in Kentucky as far as full-time works. But I've always made it a personal goal of mine to make sure those brethren have elders. And I do that because of something Paul said in the book of Titus chapter 1. If you'll turn over there with me, hold your spot in Acts 20, we'll come back to it. But in Titus chapter 1, about verse 5, I think it is, and following, Paul tells Titus, he said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. And so sometimes in the congregation there are things that are lacking. Sometimes what's lacking is teaching. Well, I've tried to fill that void. And sometimes what's lacking is oversight, elders. And so I filled that void. And I want you to think about that what is the situation as it is now. We have four elders, soon to be three. When I walk out the door, soon to be three. But we've got Brother Al and we've got Brother Randy and Brother Jan and myself. And... I'll just leave myself out of the equation for a moment. Those other men are doing a good work. They are doing a good work overseeing this congregation. It's been my privilege to serve with those men. The Bible calls us brothers in the Lord. And those men are my brothers. We've been through thick and we've been through thin. We've had disagreements amongst ourselves. But we've always come back to the fact that we're brothers in the Lord. We are brothers in Christ. And, I, and so I want you to think about that. And I want you to think about this. You know, this is the leadership. That's so critical to a church, to have good, effective leadership. And I want to tell you this. I mean it. If I were going to fight the devil himself, it would be my honor to have those men by my side fighting with me. You should feel the same way. You should feel exactly the same way because they are fighting the good fight. You're in good hands with those men. Don't worry about a thing. You are in excellent hands with those men. And they will oversee this congregation and they will show you a path of righteousness. Just stay with them and stay with those good men. 
Well, that brings me to my next point. Let's go back to Acts 20. And I'm leaving behind a church that's in danger. That might shock you a little bit. But I want you to think about this for a moment. Remember in verse 28, we read that a little earlier. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He said that for a reason, verse 29, for I know, the word for means because. He's explaining why you need to take heed to yourselves. He's explaining why you need to take heed to the, to the flock of God. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What Paul is saying here is, I'm leaving Ephesus behind, and you're in danger. And I would suggest the same thing is true today of this congregation, really of any congregation. It's not anything peculiar to you. It's just a danger that exists out there. He says, first of all, in verse 29, that there are dangers from without. See that? I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. So they're coming from the outside and infiltrating the congregation. There have been instances of that in our history, not necessarily here at Fishers, but in the history of our brethren. People come in from the outside, and they want to try and change things. They want to try and uproot things. They want to try and make this into some other kind of church than a church of Christ. And so there's a threat from the outside. But then in verse 30, he says there's also threats from inside. Also from among yourselves. Now think about who he's talking to. He's talking to the elders. And he says, from among yourselves men will rise up. Now I don't think for a moment, and I'm not suggesting for a moment it's going to come from Randy or, or Al or, or Jan. That's not what I'm saying. But he's saying the potential is there that, that threats can come from the inside. It might be somebody else sitting out here. It could be somebody sitting in this room right now. Sometimes the threats come from within. Sometimes people get the itch to move on or to change things from within. And so there are threats. And he says, uh, and remember verse 31, I've warned you. I've warned you about this. I've warned you for 16 years about this danger. We need to be careful. And, and I want you to think about a real morbid truth here. Every congregation of Christ, every church of Christ, eventually dies or falls away. Have you ever thought about that? That's the truth. That's the, every church of Christ eventually dies or falls away. Now, you want me to prove that to you? Where's the church at Rome that you read about in the Bible? Where is that church? It's gone, isn't it? Where's the church of God at Corinth? It's gone, isn't it? Where's the churches of Galatia? You know of any of them? You ever been to one, visited one, been to a gospel meeting there? Where's the church at Ephesus? Where's the church at Philippi? Where's the church at Colossae? Where is the church of the Thessalonians? Where are the seven churches of Asia? They've either died or they've fallen away. That's just a cold, hard reality, isn't it? That's a cold, hard reality and fact of life. All of those New Testament churches that we read about and we learn about and we hold up as examples for us to follow and, and we say this is what we need to be, they've all fallen away or they've died. And just to bring this up to modern day, uh, when I preached in Kentucky there was a little church uh, that used to meet in a place called Salt Lake Bend. I've told you about Salt Lake Bend before. That's where the river goes around, and, the, and there's a little road, one pathway that goes in on this big high bluff, and, and that's where the river's on both sides of the road. But you, but you go over this high bluff, and you go out into what's called Salt Lake Bend, the river bend. And there used to be a church there called the Salt Lake Bend Church of Christ. In fact, uh, Earl Robertson, he's passed away too, but he told me that one time there was actually a school down there that taught Greek to preachers down there in Salt Lake Bend. Now think of that. Uh, down there in that little obscure place in Kentucky, there was a school and there was a place where preachers were taught. They were taught Greek there. But you know what? I can drive down there right now and I can show you that empty building. The Salt Lake Bend Church of Christ is no more. It's gone. Those old people, they got old and they died and the church went by the wayside. Now, you say, well, that's pretty gloomy, isn't it? That's pretty, but that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. There's danger here. There's danger here. And what I'm saying to you is, I'm saying to the elders and to the members, your job is not on my watch. That's your, you're not going to let this church fall away on your watch. You're not going to let this church die on your watch. You're going to keep it alive. You're going to keep teaching the gospel. You're going to keep standing up for what's right. You're going to be a light in this community. It's up to you, you see. It's up to every member of this congregation. And if you don't do that, 
it'll, it'll be another statistic. Just like Salt Lake Bend, just like all those churches in the Bible, the Fisher's Church will be another statistic. Some of you are aware uh, of the church that used to be up there in Noblesville. It is no more. Some of those are here, see? But that's the point I'm making. These things change. And your job is to just say, not on my watch. That's not going to happen on my watch. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's how you're going to stop it. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, I charge you, therefore, and I'm just going to charge you right now. I'm going to give you this same charge. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the Word. That's how you're going to keep it alive. That's how you're going to keep it from dying. That's how you're going to keep it from falling away. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Why, why, why? Look at that next verse, which is the very point we're making. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Notice very carefully here, they will turn away from the truth. Away from, that implies they were with the truth. So that they here... The they who are not going to endure sound doctrine, the they who have itching ears, the they who will heap up teachers, the they who will turn away are the brethren. Not on my watch. That needs to be your mantle. Not on my watch. Not going to happen while I'm here. We're not going to turn away. We're not going to fall away. We're not going to die on the vine. We're going to be alive. We're going to be vibrant. We're going to be preaching the word. We're going to grow. Otherwise, there's danger. And so I leave behind a church in danger. That's just not peculiar to fishers. Every church is in danger all the time. That's why there's preaching and teaching and warning. That's why those things take place. Last of all, this sermon may be a little short, but that's, that's all right. Last of all, I leave behind a church who loves. Let's go back over here to the Acts chapter 20 and look at these verses. First of all, Paul taught these people to love by his own example. You can see here in verse 33 through 35. Paul says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so Paul taught them to love by his own example. He worked, and he helped those who were with him, and he supported the weak. And so by his own example, he taught these people to love. And we know that they loved him because when you read the reaction here in verse 36 on down the end of the chapter, it says, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. It was a sad parting, wasn't it? It was a sad parting on that day. But you see that Paul taught them to love by his own example. And you see that they did love. They loved him. And they cried and they fell on his neck, you see. Now, I wish, I really wish, I told you that there was already a church here when I got here. And I really wish that I could take credit for teaching you all how to love. But I didn't do that. You already knew how to do that. That's what I want you to understand. You already knew how to love. You already knew how to be Christians. You already knew how to reach out and help other people. This is, and I, I'm not just puffing up here, I mean this, this is one of the most loving group of disciples that I've ever seen in my life. And there's no partiality, there's no prejudice here, it doesn't make any difference, rich or poor, black or white, we're right there for one another when something is needed, when something happens. It's one of the most loving groups of disciples that I've ever seen. Turn with me if you will to John chapter 13. This is important. Jesus says this is a badge of discipleship. John 13 verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Can I suggest to you, by the way, before I go any further, he says it's new, but I would, I would suggest he means I renew it. It's always been true that we should love one another. That, that was true in the Old Testament. But he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. Here, here's the critical thing, verse 35. By this, by what? That you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. I'm looking into the faces of real disciples here. 
I'm looking into the faces of genuine disciples of Christ who know how to love, who didn't have to be taught how to love by me. You already knew it. You were doing it before I got here. And you're continuing to do it, and I want you to continue on in that great good work. Now, as I wrap this all up, I would suggest to you that Paul left this church in better shape than he found it. I think that should be the goal of every gospel preacher. You know, sadly, that's not always the case. Sometimes gospel preachers are the problem. And they move on from place to place and church to church because they themselves are the problem. And they stir up trouble. But every preacher should try to leave a church in better shape than he found it. And I have tried to do that. But the cold hard truth about my work is basically this. In some ways, I think that I have left you better than I found you. I really think that there have been improvements made here. But perhaps in other ways, I have failed. I've not always done everything I should do. I've not always been the perfect guy for the job. But I've tried to do the best that I know how. And I pray that God and you will forgive whatever shortcomings I've had and whatever mistakes I've made along the way. And I've made them. But I pray that you'll forgive me for that. And until we meet again, I want you to know that I love every single one of you. That's a fact. And whoever fills my shoes... You treat him just as good as you treated me. And you'll have a long, fruitful relationship together. Take out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you have another opportunity, a golden opportunity. We take these opportunities for granted sometimes. I did that early on before I became a Christian. I'd have opportunities to obey the gospel. And I'd ignore them for a long time until finally I could ignore it no longer. But I'm encouraging you not to do as I did when I was younger. Don't ignore those urgings. When you feel those urgings to obey the Lord, then do it by all means. Because the longer you put that off, the harder it is to obey. The harder it is to change because you get set in your ways. So I'm telling you this morning, if you're sitting out there and you're not a Christian and you feel the urge to obey the gospel, don't put it off any longer. Today's the day. Leave here a saved individual. Leave here in a right relationship with God. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and be baptized. Right behind me is the baptistry ready to go. And you know, you know what I'm going to say. All we need is you. How many times have I said that from the pulpit? You probably get tired of hearing it, but all we need is you. If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come now while we stand and sing?